Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program. My name is Coogan Collins, and I'm the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and study along with us. Be sure to check out all of our lessons on YouTube. Now let's get to our lesson. In this lesson, we are going to continue looking at some things that the world may perceive as disadvantages of being a Christian. The world may say to live as a Christian requires discipline both mentally and bodily. Once again, this is a true statement because living as a Christian does take great discipline. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Friends, it takes a great deal of effort to bring every one of your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. No one should ever think that a Christian can accomplish this overnight because it takes a lot of prayer and training for a person to do this. Every Christian should be working toward this go and having all your thoughts centered on righteous thinking. As Paul wrote, Philippians 4, verse number 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. There are many reasons it's important for us to have our thoughts to be like Christ's thoughts. Proverbs 23, verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. If we allow ourselves to keep thinking about perverse and dark things, guess what? That is what we'll end up being like. Don't ever try and fool yourself into thinking that you can continue to have evil thoughts in your mind and that you will never act upon them because I can promise you eventually you will act out or behave in the way that you're thinking. Proverbs 4 verse 23, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. This verse agrees with what I just said. If you don't keep your thoughts centered on God and righteous behavior, you'll become whatever your thoughts are centered on. Another important reason for us to train our thoughts is found in what Jesus said, Matthew 5, verse 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is letting us know if we are thinking in our minds of committing a sin like adultery, then we have already sinned in our hearts. You see, once you have conceived an idea in your head and you're going over it again and again, you're just one step away from literally engaging in that sin. This is why it is imperative that we keep our thoughts pure. Think about Paul for a minute. Even though he was a strong Christian, he still had to discipline himself every single day of his life. Notice what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Many times Paul compares Christianity to running a race. I think we all understand that it takes great discipline to train yourself as a runner. We must practice every day if we are going to have a fighting chance to beat the other racers. Paul uses this as an example of how every Christian must train their bodies and their minds to be able to live the Christian life. Notice Paul states that he disciplines his own body into subjection. However, one thing is 
definitely, definitely different between a foot race and the race we continually run as Christians. In a foot race, only one person wins, and even at that, the crown they will receive, it won't last forever. But those of us who run the race of Christianity will all receive that crown, and that crown will never fade away. Now the non-Christian will think that they are free and clear to do whatever they want. They think they can find great satisfaction in indulging themselves in simple practices. But the truth of the matter is that they will never be satisfied because they will constantly seek out new ways that they can top what they did before. Solomon is a man who thought he could do this as well. Look at what he had to say about this. Ecclesiastes 2 verse number 3. I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do under heaven all the days of their lives. I made my works great. I built myself houses and planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made myself water pools from which to water the growing trees of the grove. I acquired male and female servants, and I had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possession of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of provinces. I acquired male and female singers, the delights of the son of men, and musical instruments of all kinds. So I became great and excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Solomon had more than any other man probably ever had. Yet, he could not find satisfaction with all of these things. The only way to truly become content is by becoming a Christian and living a disciplined life both physically and mentally. Though it will be a long, challenging race, the reward of heaven is worth it all. The world might say that the Christian life requires one to undergo shame and ridicule. Again, this is certainly possible. Notice what Jesus says to his disciples in John 16, starting in verse 1. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that they offer God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Jesus didn't want his disciples to think that living the Christian life would be easy. They would have to undergo the shame and ridicule of being kicked out of the synagogues where they used to be welcome. They would even be put to death in the name of God because those of the world did not understand the will of God. There are many examples in the Bible of where the disciples were not treated fairly by others and even some, such as Stephen, were stoned to death. But the example I want to look at is found in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 16. Now it happened as we went to prayer, that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. 
Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Here we have Paul and Silas minding their own business. And this woman, who was possessed with a demon, keeps following them around, crying out that they were proclaiming God's word. If you really think about it, you can understand how annoying this must have been. Paul does this lady a big favor, and he cast out that demon. But this did not set well with their master because he had been making money from this demon's effect on this woman. Paul and Silas were not guilty of any crime, but they had to face great shame and ridicule as they were stripped of their clothes and they were beaten with rods in front of everyone. Those in the world would have a hard time understanding why anyone would want to have to undergo such shame and punishment and their minds would be blown by what Paul and Silas do next as they are in the inner prison, shackled up like some dangerous animals. Verse 25, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. A worldly person might say, Why in the world would they be praying and singing to God when it was because of Him and His Word that they received their punishment? The reason they did this is because they understood that they were bringing honor and glory to God. They understood that they should not fear man who can just kill the body, but they should fear God because he can destroy both body and soul in hell. Paul puts it best when he wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Christians fully understand that whatever happens to us on this earth, whether good or bad, it's temporary, and whatever we go through will by no means compare to the glory we will receive in heaven. These apostles understood this concept, and you can tell by their words, because after they had been beaten for speaking in the name of Jesus, they said that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for His name. Acts 5, verse 41. Sometimes as Christians, we may view suffering, shame, and ridicule as a disadvantage. And it may cause us to conform to a worldly view, but it's imperative that we realize that we should never be ashamed of being a Christian and following God's Word. Jesus says in Mark 8, verse 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my works in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Let's never be ashamed of being a Christian. Notice what Paul says in Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. While Christians have their problems they have to deal with, those who live like the world also have problems to deal with as well, because things don't run smoothly for them either. They face some of the same problems that we do in life, yet they only have themselves to rely on. But we as Christians, we can rely on God, and we have the hope of spending eternity in heaven. When the judgment day happens, all the sinners will feel the full guilt of their shame as they spend eternity, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Clearly, this is a huge disadvantage to being a non-Christian. So far in this lesson, we have focused on what the world perceives as being a disadvantage of being a Christian. And hopefully we have learned that these so-called disadvantages are not really disadvantages at all. Sure, the Christian may have to give up a few worldly things, but it doesn't compare to the reward we will receive in heaven. With this in mind, let's now focus on a few of the many advantages a Christian has while they live here on this earth. Our first advantage comes from Colossians 3 verse 15. 
And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. While we live on this earth as Christians, we can be very thankful because we have a true peace that the non-Christian cannot have because we know that we are united with God and we are under His protection. We know that He will take care of us which causes us to have peace and comfort in our lives. Romans 5 verse number 8 But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. As Christians, we can know we have someone who loves us and cares for us and will always be there for us. Many in the world can get to the point where they feel no one loves them. And many times, these people will commit suicide. But it doesn't matter if everyone hates us as Christians. We can still be happy knowing that God loves us. We also learn from Acts 2 verse 38 that when we become Christians, we are forgiven of our sins. And that can give us great joy in our stay here on earth, knowing that we have become servants of righteousness instead of servants of sin. Another great advantage of being a Christian is that we will have a much happier home life than those of the world. Because the Bible teaches us to love our spouses as we love ourselves, and not to invoke wrath in our children, but to train them up in the peaceful life of a Christian. Now, being a Christian doesn't guarantee a happy home because there is still the human factor involved. But if a Christian home follows the guidelines of what the Bible says, every Christian home would be a happy one. In general, a Christian home is far better off than that of the home of a sinner. There's also a great advantage of being a Christian when it comes to suffering from what this life dishes out. Paul says in Romans 8 verse 16, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children than heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It doesn't matter what we go through on this earth. We can take great comfort in knowing that we will receive the glory of heaven. But the sinner doesn't have this comfort, and they will really struggle when times of hardship come their way. In conclusion, we must understand as Christians that there are things that we must give up, and we need to realize that those things we give up only bring about a passing pleasure and will by no means compare to the reward we will receive in heaven. Notice what Jesus said about counting the cost. Luke 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Well, what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. The world of people will continue to view Christianity as a disadvantage. But on the judgment day, their eyes will be open. Though it will be too late for them, they will wish they had accepted the truth instead of enjoying a temporary life of sin. As Christians, we can understand that the worldly are the ones who are really at a disadvantage because when we endure the life of a Christian, we will get to spend eternity in heaven instead of hell. Hope you found this lesson helpful. No matter what lesson I preach, I want you to test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to the Bible. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it is too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we're capable of being wrong. One thing we know for sure is that God's Word will not lead us astray, so we can always trust in it. 
As Psalm 146.3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Psalm 18, verse 30, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter. If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course that you can take that will walk you through the basics. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I've preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials that you are free to study and use. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you'll find our new video lessons like the one that you're watching now. I know we live in a fast-paced world where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything. But I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy, but we must be careful that we don't get to the point where we get so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority. If you find my lessons to be helpful, be sure and tell people about our program so that others can hear sound lessons from the Bible. I hope you have a blessed day.